Hello, I'm Reverend Scott Whipperman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana, and we welcome you to our worship service today. I'd like you to know that regardless of who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here at First Presbyterian Church. Listen carefully. I think it's verse 20 of this passage sounds an awful lot like what Susan read from Ecclesiastes. Luke 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Irma Bombeck once said that life begins when the kids move out and the dog dies. And that's where Pearl and I are. According to Irma, our life began several years ago. We had to put our dog down. Our three daughters are married with their own lives and their own families. Not only are we empty nesters, our kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids have all flown the coop. They are all out of state, and we need to travel to see them. On the homeward-bound leg of our last, our latest, offspring inspection tour, we stopped at the rest area near Du Bois, Idaho. I needed to get out from behind the wheel to stretch to get the kinks out. The cleaning crew was spiffing up the restrooms, but I was content to walk around swinging my arms, shaking my legs, rolling my shoulders and my head. One of the cleaners asked Pearl, are you with the old guy with the white hair? <laughs> That's me, the old guy with the white hair. The signs of age and mortality are ever present. A year or so ago, I was eating lunch with fellow volunteers in the canteen at the Fort Harrison Medical Center. A, a young woman passed our table. Apparently, she thought she could improve on her comely, comely natural appearance with tattoos and piercings. Several of us old guys with white hair expressed our thoughts with various facial expressions. And there was a whispered chorus of kids nowadays. Someone observed that we sounded a lot like our fathers and grandfathers before them. Then one of my table mates told us his dilemma. He had a classic car restored to the point it looked as though he had just driven it off the showroom floor. He was coming to the age when he no longer had the ambition or energy to show and care for the car as he should. He was hesitant to sell it because he knew he could never get enough to cover the money and sweat equity he had invested. He was reluctant to leave it to his estate because he knew his son would not appreciate and care for it. He was thinking about giving it away to someone he trusted. He sounded a lot like the teacher in this morning's Old Testament reading. Listen to our fellow Pres Montana Presbyterian, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase 
of Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 and 19 in the message. I can't take it with me. No, I have to leave it to whoever comes after me, whether they're worthy or worthless. And who's to tell? They'll take over the earthly results of my intense thinking and hard work. There's a reason manufacturers don't put receiver hitches in her hearses. There's a reason they don't put receiver hearses, receiver hitches in hearses. I'll get it. It is not practical to pull a U-Haul to the cemetery. You can't take it with you. You got to leave it behind. Who knows what will happen to it? That worried the teacher. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much money you make, the professor and the dropout, the tycoon and the penthouse office, and the janitor in the basement, we are all going to end up in a hearse without a trailer hitch. Warren Buffett and I have that in common. We are going to exit this life the same way we entered it, with nothing. Whatever we accumulated will let be left behind. When Warren Buffett takes that final ride to the cemetery, someone else will run Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Berkshire Hathaway. When I take my last ride to the Fort Harrison Cemetery, somebody will get my pickup. I hope they don't wreck it. <laughs> I grew up being taught that King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes I understand some scholars have a different opinion, but I have no problem imagining Solomon, a somewhat cynical old guy with white hair, looking back on his life, journaling observations with a sense of humor and irony. I suggest that you take some time to read the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. It should not take long. It's only 14 pages in our pew Bible and read it all in one setting. Please read it, but don't read it like some heavy theological tome. Read it like you would read Mark Twain or Garrison Keillor. If possible, read it from a modern translation or a paraphrase. Read Ecclesiastes because I think it will make you smile. Read Ecclesiastes, I think you will be amazed that the words of the teacher written so many centuries ago remain so contemporary today. Read Ecclesiastes. It just might be the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down this election year. <laughs> Some thousand years after Solomon, there was another teacher in Israel. The stained glass window to my left depicts the scene when this teacher, a mere lad of 12, taught temple theologians. The scene in this morning's gospel is about 20 years later. In the first verse of chapter 12, Dr. Luke tells us Jesus was teaching a large crowd. He was talking about the dangers of hypocrisy. He taught about the work of the Holy Spirit who will inspire in time of trouble. He taught about the love and care of the Creator who has numbered the white hair on this old guy's head, and yours too. Then in the middle of all that, there was this demand from a voice in the crowd, teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. Imagine the crassness. Jesus has been teaching, about <clears throat> teaching profound concepts about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Then there was this interruption. A voice insists Jesus arbitrate a family dispute. No doubt some considered the demand rude, out of place, an unhappy interruption. We don't know the particular circumstances leading to the demand Jesus adjudicate an inheritance. Was it a case like Jacob and Esau where the younger brother outfoxed his older sibling? Was the family patriarch so disappointed with one of, the, one of his sons that he cut him out? Was one brother clearly cheating the other? Dr. Luke does not give us the history of the demand that Jesus get involved, but Dr. Luke does give us Jesus' response, thanks but no thanks. 
This is out of my jurisdiction. Resolving your sibling conflict is not what I'm here for. And while Jesus declined to intervene, Jesus perceived the root of the dispute, greed. Jesus warned the crowd, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Dr. Luke does, <clears throat> greed is defined in Merriam-Webster as a selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. In this morning's epistle reading in Colossians 3, verse 6, St. Paul defines greed as idolatry, a life shaped by things and feelings instead of being shaped by God. Greed is a desire for advantage at the expense of another. Greed entices us to take more than our share, leaving less for others. Greed is a sense of entitlement for things. Greed, peaches, greed preaches a gospel of selfishness. Greed whispers to us, more, more, more. The more you get, the better you are. Jesus used a parable to demonstrate his warning about greed. And we know it as the parable of the rich fool. There was a farmer blessed by God. His soil was good and the rains came at the right time. He had a series of really good crops. He had no place to store this year's abundant harvest. His, grains and bar his barns and granaries were already full. So without thought or consideration of God or his neighbors, the man made plans to tear down his existing barn and the barns and the granaries had already held more than they needed. He made plans to replace his existing barns with larger barns so he could accumulate and store more of what he already had too much of. Once he has those larger barns full, he plans to take life easy, eat, drink and be merry, take an early retirement, live the remainder of his life for himself. He did not know it, but that was his last night on planet Earth. Jesus closes the parable of the rich fool saying, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Is wanting more of something than is really needed really bad? Don't we all desire abundance? We pray for our daily bread, but we are happy to have an extra loaf in the freezer. It seems prudent to have money set aside to cushion ourselves in a time of need. We don't want to work until we die. That's why we contribute to our pension fund. That's why we have IRAs, 401ks, and Cs. Jesus never condemned wealth. Jesus is not going to call us fools when we save some of our good fortune for a rainy day. Jesus' parable did not infer that the farmer was a fool because he was blessed by God with good crops and wealth. Jesus not, did not say the farmer was a fool because his barns were full. Jesus said he was a fool because his barns were full and his heart was empty. He failed to grasp the basic truth that the fullness of his barns was evidence of the fullness of God's grace. He stored up stuff for himself, but ignored the one who created him and his stuff. Jesus was affirming what the ancient teacher wrote in Ecclesiastes. Jesus and Paul condemned greed. Jesus and Paul warned us to curb the selfish an excessive desire for what we want that becomes greed, which is idolatry. When we love and treasure our stuff more than our God, that is idolatry. Our stuff is not really ours. God created us, God created our stuff. And our stuff, we and our stuff belong to God. The way we treat our stuff, especially us in America living the American dream, the way we treat our abundance and our wealth influences our spirit. Good spiritual health requires we invest more in our heart 
than in our barns. The conclusion of the parable of the rich fool is that those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God end up dead in their spirit. What does it mean to be rich toward God? The term rich typically prompts thoughts of money, wealth, prosperity, stuff. In the Bible, money, wealth, possessions, or finance, finances are mentioned more than 50 times. The Bible's discussion of wealth, money, and possessions are usually based on and related to the basic commandments that we love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves. When we love God, we are rich toward God. When we love our neighbor, we are rich toward God. When we love God and our neighbor, we show gratitude to God for his grace, gratitude for the blessings he has given us. Gratitude towards God makes us rich towards God. Gratitude is the antidote for greed. The term rich typically prompts thoughts of money, wealth, property, and, <clears throat> excuse me, God gave the rich fool everything necessary to grow the crop and gather the abundant harvest, but the crops and the harvest were not intended for his selfish benefit. The rich man was a fool hoarding the grain, thinking it gave him, gave, the, <clears throat> the rich man was a fool hoarding his grain, thinking that his grain gave his life value. We may value what we own, but what we own gives us no value. The parable's farmer was rich, his barns were full. He could have and should have been rich toward God by showing God his gratitude. He could have shown God his gratitude by blessing others with the blessings God sent his way. The rich fool forgot he should, forgot he should love God with his whole heart, whole mind, whole spirit, and whole strength. He forgot he should love his neighbors as himself. I don't think it's any accident that Dr. Luke follows the parable of the rich fool with Jesus teaching about lilies and birds fed and clothed by God. Eugene Peterson's message paraphrases St. Paul's teaching in this morning's epistle lesson this way. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the right, things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perception and from his perspective. When we see the world from Jesus' perspective, we see that we are not the sum of our possessions. If we spend our energy, our money, and our time gathering things, we have little time and energy left to fill our hearts with richness towards God. We are all familiar with Jesus' teachings in Matthew 6. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A few verses later, Jesus said, we must seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. You probably memorized those passages in Sunday school. Various versions of the following have been on the internet for some time. Maybe you're familiar with it. It captures some of what today's scripture lessons teach. First, Jesus is not impressed with what kind of car you drive. Jesus cares about how many people you gave a ride when they didn't have transportation. Jesus is not impressed with the square footage of your house, but Jesus cares about how many people you welcomed into your home. Jesus is not impressed with the clothes you wear, but Jesus cares about how many you help to clothe. Jesus is not impressed with your highest, what your highest salary was, but Jesus cares whether you compromised your integrity to obtain it. 
Jesus is not impressed with what your job title is, but Jesus cares whether you perform your job to the best of your ability. Jesus is not impressed with how many friends you have. Jesus cares about how many people to whom you have been a really good friend. Jesus is not impressed by the neighborhood in which you live, but Jesus cares about how you treat your neighbors. Earlier, I encouraged you to read Ecclesiastes, to savor and enjoy the words of the teacher. You'll find that they describe so much of our life as vanity in the King James Version or meaningless in the New International Version. Eugene Peterson's message paraphrases it as smoke. In the end, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, is the crux of the teacher's pondering and the crux of life. Listen. Now all has been heard, the teacher wrote. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Fearing God and keeping his commandments may seem an overwhelming task. Obedience and faithfulness can seem impossible, but when we really dig down, the spirit of the law, the spirit of God's commandments is not so difficult. God loves us. God loves us and empowers us to love back to God and out to others. That's it. The law is love. The commandment is to love God and love our neighbor. If you do that, no matter what you have in your barn, your heart will be full. You will be rich towards God. Please pray with me. Generous God, by your mercy, you provide all that we really need. Teach us not to store up treasures for ourselves on earth, but to put our trust and hope in the extravagance of your grace so that we might come to inherit the abundant life you offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.